Hello, everyone, and welcome to this. This is a special edition of The Shift. I am joined today by uh, my co-host, the LINE International Executive Director, George Roche, and we're going to have a conversation today with Maxime Bernier. He is the leader of the People's Party uh, out of Canada. So we're going to have a conversation about third parties and how they can influence this lockdown conversation. Uh, Maxime was a member of the Conservative Party in Canada for many years, uh, and he split, uh, I guess it's been about a year and a half now, uh, to start the People's Party because he was... uh, feeling like he couldn't reform the system from within. So he started a separate party and now he is uh, continuing with that work and he has started a uh, caucus, uh, an anti-lockdown caucus with other members of parliament and other people who have kind of split away from, from the current political system in order to try to have a conversation about lockdown policy. Um, One of the things that I've done on this program in the past, and those of you who've listened will know, is that I've had conversations now uh, with people like George who've been organizing protests and working the judicial angle to fight the lockdowns, uh, as well as uh, a couple of interviews about the constitutional sheriff concept where you can approach your local sheriff uh, or your local police department with the idea that if they don't enforce these lockdown policies, then uh, maybe that's a workaround. Uh, But Today, we wanted to have Maxime on so we can talk about the political angle, which I think, from what I've seen so far, is probably the most difficult challenge because the governments, uh, both in the United States and in Canada, have just accepted lockdown policy without question. So fighting it through the political system uh, seems like a pretty tough uh, road to hoe there, but I'm happy to have Maxime on. Uh, in order to be able to explain to us how that's working for him and what some of his plans are in terms of working from within the political system to make some of these changes, or at least have a public and open debate about uh, these lockdown policies where um, those who oppose lockdowns are given a voice. So Maxime, thanks for coming on the show. And do you want to just give people a little bit more about your own personal history and about the People's Party uh, as an introduction in your own words? Yes, thank you very much. I'm very happy and pleased to be with you. Uh, First of all, uh, like you said, um, I was elected in 2006 uh, for uh, here in Canada for the Conservative Party of Canada. And I was a conservative for the last uh, 13 years. Um, I was a minister under Stephen Harper government. And uh, I was running also. I did run for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. I didn't win with 49% of the vote. But, um, you know, I'm happy after that, you know, I tried to push the Conservative Party of Canada for them to have a platform that would be more conservative, more based on individual freedom and personal responsibility, fairness and respect. I was not successful after um, not winning the leadership. Um, I tried to influence the establishment of the Conservative Party of Canada. uh, And at the end, uh, I decided to uh, quit the party. And we created the People's Party of Canada. Uh, We uh, had our first election in 2019, October 2019, first year, first election. Uh, It went, uh, I think, not too bad for our first election. We had 1.6% of the vote. Um, If you uh, compare that with the Green Party here in Canada, it took them 20 years and six elections to have more than 1.6% of the vote, and we did that in one year. So now what we want to do is to consolidate our support. Maybe we'll have another general election in Canada this spring, or uh, it's a minority government, so you never know when. We need to be ready. And our goal is to uh, increase our percentage of the vote for maybe 5 6 7%. Uh, We'll see what will happen. But in the meantime, like you said, We are uh, fighting against the lockdowns here in Canada. And uh, we created uh, with other uh, elected representatives at the provincial, uh, municipal and federal level who, like us, uh, want uh, to end the lockdowns. We created the End the Lockdowns National Caucus in Canada. And now we have about uh, 25 uh, uh, elected uh, representatives that uh, are part of that uh, caucus with us. And we are asking also the population to uh, support us, support that caucus by signing our petition. Uh, They can go on the uh, LibertyCoalitionCanada.com website and they're going to see our petition. 
And so my ask right now, because like you said in the beginning, it's very hard to very hard to uh, have a discussion about lockdowns here in Canada. Um, and we don't have any opposition at the federal level or the provincial levels. There's no opposition. The, the opposition, uh, they don't want to speak against lockdowns because, you know, about 70 percent of the population agree with that. And so that's uh, when you are a politician, you want to be elected, you want to have a, a lot of support. And so they're afraid to defend our, our rights and our freedom. So that's why we created that uh, national caucus. And I hope that we'll have uh, more uh, elected representative that would be with us to do that fight and to start a discussion about the impact of these uh, lockdowns uh, in Canada. Well, that's interesting because, you know, Baber, who was uh, Roman Baber, was just booted by Ford recently. Yeah. And he was in a Zoom call with us the other day uh, with a bunch of people, actually. And he was explaining now is the time to inundate the inboxes of the 70 percent and yeah. Instagram and Facebook and tag them, call them. And, you know, we're in a bit of a war here. Uh, we don't have bullets. Our weapons, are our voice, our pens, and our computers, and our phones. And I think that people need to be encouraged uh, at every level to rely on those as the means to the end that we're trying to achieve. Now, everybody, and I don't think it matters anymore what party you're with. This is not a popularity contest anymore. This is not about votes. This is about our very way of life. The way of life, whether that be politics, whether that be community, municipal, it doesn't matter. This country is in harm's way right now. I think we need complete and utter unity, and we're seeing so much division. And of course, in that, you know, a divided society or community or relationship of any sort is much easier to control and impede, and we're experiencing this. Now, Maxime, you attended a number of protests during October. I remember when you were in the by-election yeah. in Toronto. Yeah. And, you know, you were very clear in your position at that point. Uh, we had been speaking out about the lockdowns. In fact, you were there when we told 10 or 11,000 people you're going to be locked down by December. We knew this was coming. We knew another lockdown was coming. We knew it was going to be more intense. The restrictions would be increased. The noose around Canadians' necks would be tightened. Businesses, schools, everything. We've touched many parts of the system here that have interrupted the lives of Canadian citizens and just about every occupational walk of life we can think of. What? Why now did this caucus get formed? What was the <clears throat> impetus to put this together uh, as quickly as you did? Because we think that um, a lot of people agree with us. They agree, but they're scared to speak out. They're scared to uh, speak to their friends or their families about what they believe. And we want to give them, you know, you can speak out. You can uh, speak uh, in line with your values. And we want them to have the courage of their convictions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. So we decided member of the uh, representative elected and former representative that are elected at the federal, provincial or municipal levels to be together and to encourage uh, everybody to speak out. And I think the timing is, is good right now because we had one year of lockdowns and uh, it's an experiment that didn't work. And I think people now are a little bit more fed up with all that. And I hope that our... Um, our national caucus against lockdowns will have more support. But that's only the beginning. You need to express your point of view if you believe in something. And I can tell you that today I was on the call. I was calling a lot of people in Quebec, representative at the municipal levels, and they're ready to be with us. And so we'll have more and more people a part of that caucus and also the population can go on the website and, and, and support us by signing our petition. So we have more than 15,000 people that decided to sign our petition. And I think it's a nice beginning. But, uh, you know, we have a voice and that's important to, to be out there. And, uh, you know, what would be the impact of our work? I don't know. But you need to, we need to try everything. We may have another meeting in uh, Toronto, maybe in a month, 
and just to look at uh, what we can do. So every uh, every uh, member of the caucus will see what will be the next step. But um, uh, we, we we don't have any any tang tangible power right now to change things because we are in, kind of in, in the opposition. But the more people, the better it will be. So how are you going to drum up the support other than a petition? Because right now we're in a crucial moment. Uh, Baber, Roman Baber, made it very clear uh, in his letter to Doug Ford what his views and position was. And he was unceremoniously booted from caucus. Are, are we dealing with a cancel culture mindset here? Uh, absolutely. What happened to Roman, it's a shame. You know, he is he, part of a, a caucus. He's, he was part of a government, and you know we are in a democracy. And I think uh, you can say that pretty clearly. And we are seeing that that Mr. Ford uh, doesn't want any opposition in this party and doesn't want any uh, discussion about lockdowns. And so, but he also uh, doesn't I, want the deaths at his door. Please allow the interjection. He also doesn't yeah. want the deaths at his door. Roman said. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why or, you or know, to lose I, his seat. I did. I did the video, and I congratulated uh, Roman for his courage, uh, and that's good. But what <laughs> what can in Quebec? If you look at what happened in Quebec right now, we uh, we have a curfew, uh, and uh, it's not a stay at home; it's a curfew. You cannot uh, be outside your house after eight o'clock p.m. until five o'clock a.m. And the way that uh, they're, they're trying to justify that is to say, you know, uh, we don't want people to uh, be out there and meet, uh, meet their friends because more people would be together and that can be very bad. But we must uh, explain, like Roman did in his letter, in his letter that, um, you know, 99% of the uh, people who had COVID under 70 years old they won't die. 99% of them won't die with COVID-19. And, you know, the the lockdowns are creating more harms to the population than the virus itself. There's a lot of depression right now. People are waiting for surgeries that they don't have. They don't, you don't, you can have the cancer and you cannot have any treatments for that. So that's a uh, that's uh, scary. So it's, I hope I hope people will will join us and uh, in our fight. Yeah. It's no longer controversial, is it, Doug? It's no longer controversial that people are dying, are overdoses, depression. Go ahead. Well, Maxime, I did want to have a question. Uh, we don't have you for too long, and I wanted to give you a chance to talk about uh, how difficult has it been to get this messaging across? Are you having, I mean, I if it's anything like it is in the United States, you, you probably aren't being courted by mainstream media sources. Uh, and we've been seeing a lot of this um, big tech censorship of any kind of anti-lockdown messaging. So uh, how are you trying to get the word out, and have you seen... Um, a kind of a pushback either via uh, social media censorship or what kind of relationship are you having with the corporate media in terms of getting the messaging across? Yeah, actually, it's very hard with the mainstream media, as you may know. Uh, <clears throat> but I was able to be I was able to be in the mainstream media in Canada in the National Post last weekend uh, because I took a flight uh, to Montreal, Toronto to Montreal, and I had my mask, but just under my nose, and uh, uh, the um, the um, uh, people of in the the, um, uh, the flight uh, attendant, the flight flight attendant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was looking for <laughs> the flight attendant. The attendants came to me and said, "You don't have your, you don't wear your mask correctly." And I will be, uh, I will advise the security in Montreal. I said, uh, "Sorry, I was, uh, I, I, I just had a nap in the plane, and my mask went just above my nose." But because of that. Yeah, and so I had a discussion with the security uh, when I when I was uh, when I arrived in Montreal, and I told them, and they said it's okay, we won't give you an etiquette, and we understand that. Uh, and so thank you, Mr. Bernie. But uh, somebody spoke with the National Post, and that was <laughs> in the National Post. But right. the good news is, uh, at the end, they uh, they were speaking about our uh, national caucus for ending the lockdown. So at least we had a piece in the national media. <laughs> um, but 
that was the, the positive on that. But it's very, very hard. And that's why I want to be back on the road. I want to do some rally all across the country as soon as possible to speak about that. Uh, you know, it is time now to, to be out there. And I don't want to wait anymore. I have an invitation to be in, uh, in uh, Alberta in the beginning of March. So I'll be there and I'll do a rally over there. I'll speak about that. But answering your question, the national uh, mainstream media media are ignoring us um, and uh, we need to use the uh, social media. But at least on social media, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have any uh, censorship coming from the uh, big uh, tech corporation. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm very pleased with that. Well, right now, okay, so you're going to go out, you're going to do some rallies. And I, I don't know if you've seen um, – YouTube or any of the videos flying around on Twitter. But right now they're squashing peaceful protesting. 2C is under attack by the very people who swore an oath to uphold these rights. And again, we don't have any science on on the uh, this this disease, the bad flu season. Uh, I don't want to use the C word. That seems to be uh, against uh, YouTube and, and Facebook. But right now the people who are actually rallying as you have seen, are now being arrested before, during, and after these protests. Not only are they being arrested, they're being assaulted. Now, you spoke of in the article with the rest of the crew, uh, the rest of the caucus, that these lockdowns violate rights. We have a deliberate violation now on thousands of cameras. What are you going to say to Canadians about the armed forces, and I'm sorry, about the uh, law enforcement in our country deliberately engaging in the violation of 2C, Section 1, uh, 10, as a matter of fact, because there are abuse people in there, and mobility issues coming to the surface now. You can't go to the land your taxes bought you, hmm. and you can't speak out with the voice God gave you. Where do we go from here? So we must do more protests, and I think that's important. You know, I want um, I want to have a tickets about uh, being part of, of a protest or a rally, and I will fight that. And I'm saying to everybody that if you have a tickets, don't pay that. Fight it because it's against our constitution. It's illegal, and and, and you will win in, in from the court. But you know, it will take time for. So that's why we need to change the public opinion. And that's a big task. I understand that. To do that, we need to be out there and we need courageous people to come to our rallies and, and to, be, to, to, to just be vocal and explaining to our others that, um, you know, we are not in an authoritarian uh, uh, state here in Canada. We're supposed to be a free country and we're not with these uh, uh, authoritarian measures that are imposing, that our government is imposing on us. Well, that's interesting you say that. And Doug, you know, we've experienced a lot of fear. We're doing this in our other show in Mystification with The Shift, mm -hmm. the 15-part series. Uh, right now, we've got what we're told is a state of emergency, yet we've been able to determine that not one of the 10 provinces met the criteria for a state of emergency. What do you think the strategy is to maintain and keep this state of emergency in place? What is the strategy behind that in your mind? Maxime, but what is the strategy? Uh, when they, why did why they did it? Why they did that? Uh, why are they maintaining a state of emergency when there otherwise is evidence far more to the contrary that there is one than there is one th than there is an emergency? What's going on there? Yeah, I don't understand. We must ask the question to these uh, governments, to Trudeau and Legault in Quebec and Ford in Ontario. Um, you know, th they're they, not answering. They're not answering. They, <laughs> they're not answering. I know they're not answering, and that's, you know, that's too bad. But uh, there, there's no justification for all that, like you just said. And I don't know what they have in mind. Uh, they try to protect everybody, but they must protect the older. They must protect uh, people, uh, pe people that are in a in a government uh, senior home. That's the, that's the most important. Uh, tasks that they can do and they are not doing that pretty well right now but they are imposing on us on everybody in Canada 
uh, very strong restrictions on our freedom. And I'm very pleased that I have time to be with you and to speak about that with you on your show. Uh, and I will do that. I will speak about it. And um, I hope at the end they will understand the, uh, the common sense. We need a common sense revolution. Uh, that's, that, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Well, we're dealing with the significant anxiety-ridden psychology right now. And I mean, if there's anything that inhibits good thinking, good decision-making, informed decision-making, it's fear. And we said before, that's false evidence appearing real. What isn't false is that we do have our elderly dying, our frontline nurses, uh, Maxine, you were at Dundas Square. You saw Sarah Chajunian get up there and speak. She's now with the undercover nurse out of New York who broke the story about her mm -hmm. encounter with one of the doctors. We have a group of nurses being ostracized right now for telling us the truth. We yeah. know what they have experienced is real, that our senior citizens are dying at the hands of some of these people and even the remedies. We know the money, $39,000 a ventilator. I think it's $13,000 a test. I can't remember if that's even correct, Doug. But the reality mm -hmm. here is there's a huge economic game going ben uh, on beneath all of this that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Maxime, let me ask you, do you think there are other uh, events going on behind the distraction of this disease? Uh, Rocco mentioned this in his... Uh, uh, statement of claim to the oligarchs on July 6th uh, filed in the Supreme Court of Canada. And he makes it very clear what he feels the motivations are. Do you agree with him? Well, I, I don't remember what he said. I don't know what he said, but uh, there's uh, the motivation over there. It's, uh, you know, politicians don't want to be blamed. And so when they are listening to the expert, uh, medical expert, they always go with the strong the strongest measures to be sure that nobody can blame them for not being not acting on something and uh, and that's what happened right now they go too far over there and they don't want to take any risk but now they did that and they convinced the population that it's a, it's a very dangerous uh, 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 very dangerous uh, covid-19 and we must do everything to fight that but what now we have the data after a year, one year, and we know that, you know, it's not dangerous for younger people under 70 years old. So the, the mentality to try not to be blamed on doing something, they went too far. And now because they went too far, they, they, have, they, they have the population on their side and they scare the population. So it's very... It's very difficult for us to change the public opinion. But I, I don't know. I, I think they don't want to listen to other experts. They are listening to their uh, establishment uh, medical expert without going and, and looking at other, the other expert that said the, the opposite about lockdowns. Right. Well, Shabazz, the, the guy from 87 to 97 who trained Williams, who's in Doug Ford's ear, just supported Baber in his assertions. Yeah. Now we're we're three hundred and eighty billion or so dollars in debt. The seventy percent of people that agree with the lockdowns, maybe that debt should be ascribed to their tax package. <laughs> right? I mean, well, the other people are doing justice, you know, resisting the increase, and yet we've got reports out of India from Qantas News that says that. Trudeau is spending $40 million an hour. He's getting ready to give $250 billion away in aid. That's $40 million an hour that he has spent from go. How do we justify that kind of a bill? Yeah, we, we cannot. We cannot. We, uh, we are bankrupt right now in Canada. We have a huge debt, huge, de huge deficit. But the, the worst of that, it's uh, Justin Trudeau believes that um, you know more stimulus more debt will help everybody but you know it won't uh, when you are printing money like that or spending money that you don't have like that uh, at the end you have inflation and inflation is a hidden tax and everybody will have to pay instead of having the courage to tax canadians for their spending 
uh, what they are saying to Canadians, they're saying, you know, you can keep your money in your own pockets, but you won't be able to buy the same uh, amounts of goods and services with that money because of inflation. So now Correct. that's what happened here in Canada. And, and, and the federal government is encouraging provinces to have lockdowns because the federal government is saying to provinces, yeah, you can have lockdowns and we'll uh, have a program that will compensate people and would compensate businesses. So go, go ahead and do your lockdowns. I think, you know, that's why we have a huge deficit and, and uh, we won't be able to repay that. In a, it will take times, but it will take uh, another financial crisis and it's too bad. But the population don't know that at the end, all that money, you know, it's the first time in history when you have a recession. We are in a recession right now when the income of the family is going up. Usually, when you have a recession, your income is going down. But the uh, average income for a family in Canada is going up with that recession. So that means that the federal government is giving a lot of money to family, to businesses, but money that we don't have. So mm, at right. the end, at the end, it will be a big disaster, and we'll have a, we have inflation right now. If you go and do your grocery. You'll, the inflation, it's about 4 or 5% there. So we'll yeah. have a, a general inflation and everybody will pay for that. That's irresponsible. Absolutely. I've got, I've got one more point I'd like to make. I th- I, we're kind of closing in on time here, but I wanted to ask uh, one more question in closing just so that uh, Maxime would have a chance to respond because the People's Party has been uh, called, I think, a, a populist movement uh, in the press, and then the populist movements are also, by association, uh, being accused of having a white nationalist elements or racist elements within their ranks. And I just wanted to: uh, do, would you consider uh, would you consider this a populist movement? And how do you define that? And then, what is your response to these uh, accusations of racism? Yes, the People's Party of Canada is a populist uh, political party, but I must add a smart populist political party because we don't try to appeal to your emotions. We try to appeal to your intelligence and we do we are doing politics differently based on principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect and fairness. And all our policies are based on these uh, principles. So we won't tell you what you want to hear. We won't try to please everybody. We are doing politics by conviction. And we believe that we have the best ideas based on the Western civilization and freedom and free markets. We don't believe that uh, uh, the federal government in Ottawa know better than you what what is good for you you know the you know better what is good for you and we are doing politics with without doing any also uh uh like i must um the political uh uh rectitude uh how do you call that the uh uh we don't try to please everybody and so by doing that we are uh, doing politics that may, you may maybe won't like what we are saying about being responsible in a smaller government. Yeah, you're saying that you're I, not catering. You're not catering to... We're, we're, we're not pandering. Yes, thanks. Yeah. We're not pandering to every special interest group. We are doing politics for all Canadians. And we don't try to be politically correct. Uh, I think that's important. So I think I answer your question about us being a smart populist political party and with conservative values, uh, small government, lower taxes, and, and less government in our in our day-to-day life. And about uh, the, 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 the second part of your question about mm-hmm. racism, we, <clears throat> we have a position on immigration that is very different than all the other political parties. We want fewer immigrants. We want actually a moratorium on immigration right now because we are in the middle of the economic crisis and we are the only party who speak about that. But we are asking everybody who share our values, come with us. So <clears throat> some people try to paint us as a racist party because we want fewer immigrants. And actually, I mean, from uh, I will be in court 
uh, this spring in uh, Toronto because the Conservative Party of Canada with uh, Mr. Kinsella uh, said that I was a racist because of our position on immigration. And, you know, I'm, I'm fighting. It's too important. It's my reputation and the reputation of the, of the People's Party of Canada. So I'll be in court. I will win that. Uh, there's absolutely no proof if you look at everything that I said since I, I started uh, in politics in uh, 2006. I'm always doing politics based on principle. So all these uh, racist people are not welcome in our party. And if they want to uh, create a party, they can create their own party. But we are a party that believes in people and we don't try to pander to every special interest group and we don't judge you by the color of your skin. We are judging people by their, their merits. Like Martin Luther King said, you know, we are uh, color uh, blendless and we don't, we don't look at the people like the Trudeau government is doing right now. Try to have a program for, for black Canadians and other program for, no, we will do politics and that would our program or our actions will be based for all Canadians without any distinction. So answering your questions, the racist, if there are some racist people in Canada, the People's Party is not their own. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, Maxime, today, I mean, I understand your statement behind uh, principal politics. The issue here we have right now is conventional wisdom and conventional responses are not working very well in a corrupt system. It's very difficult to rely on conventional wisdom and conventional responses when you have the goalposts being moved, the rules, the rules being tossed out the window, rights being kicked to the curb, and a new set of rules. We even have our media being attacked uh, publicly uh, by our own law enforcement. How could we possibly ascribe conventional wisdom, conventional responses, when that kind of abuse is going on? You know, that's why I left the Conservative Party of Canada. I said that this party and the establishment of that party is morally and intellectually corrupt. They're not conservative anymore. They're, and actually, the, the new leader, Aaron O'Toole, said that this party is a, is a centrist party and his goal is to split the, liberals, the liberal votes. So he, he, he wants to have more votes from the left. And uh, we are now the only uh, right-wing uh, political party in Canada. But that being said, it's very difficult uh, to uh, be out there and, and to fight for what we believe B because, you know, people are used to uh, listen to a politician and, you know, they will vote for what they want personally. So uh, if a politician will give a favor to a, a person or a special group, uh, they may have the support of that uh, group. We need, that's like I said in the beginning, we are appealing to our intelligence. And at the end, there's no free lunch in a democracy. So you will have to pay for it. And, and you know, I will fight. You know, when I started uh, the party, we were only, uh, we were <laughs> only a, a couple of uh, people. Now we have more than 300,000 people who voted for us. We need to grow and stick to our principle. I believe that, you know, it, it, the... The right ideas, we have the right ideas. It's not because our ideas right now are not popular that uh, these ideas are not, uh, are not right and just. Our ideas are just and, and, and right and fair. We just have to explain that to uh, the population. And that's what I like in politics. It's my challenge. And just to be out there and to speak and to explain that. The more people who reach, the better it would be for us. And I think at the end, the better it would be for democracy. I think so. And the reality now is I believe the party that is going to lead the way in this country is one that's going to show us a plan to protect the very rights we've never been faced with defending in 170 years. That plan has not been tabled. What we have seen is clearly the negotiated plan to abolish the rights uh, uh, to deny their preservation and and eliminate uh, the necessary protections of the charter, uh, as clearly uh, uh, demonstrated in Toronto over the past couple of weeks, where several arrests have been made, albeit on un unconstitutionally. What message would you bring to our law enforcement, who is doing this to the very people who are rallying, who are standing up? 
whose voices are being heard, who aren't worried about losing their job or their material world or their statures or their reputation. These are people who are using their real names out there in the public. What would you say to law enforcement who is attacking and physically grabbing women, men that have been out there weekly standing up for their fellow citizens? But what I can what I can say is I understand that they are uh, enforcing the rules and the regulation that uh, their government is imposing on us. So the ultimate uh, res- ultimate responsible for that is our our politicians right now. That the message must go to them, and you know there's a way to uh, enforce a, a, a rules or a regulation. Uh, well, we, by at the same time respecting our, our, our freedom and, and just doing, I just I understand that they're doing their job, but there are some people that are using a little bit uh, too much power to do their jobs, and uh, and we cannot tolerate that in a democracy. But my main message is for the politicians who are in, who are voting these regulations and and and, and asking the, the police. To enforce it, so uh, the, the 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 responsibility at the end it's uh, at our politician. Okay, well the caucus knows that what is being done right now is against human rights. It's I think you said it, or maybe uh, Hillier yeah. uh, Hillier said it, uh, who's been very very vocal. He's also got his own tickets, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Uh, yeah. for for being for for being out there. The, now, what what is the caucus thinking of doing? Have you guys discussed this amongst yourself, Sloan and and uh, yeah. and the rest? Have you guys said, "Hey, listen, people are getting attacked, vi- rights are being violated, nurses are speaking out, even the front line is not content with what's going on." What are you guys going to do about this? Yeah, first of all, we uh, created that uh, end the lockdowns national caucus, and uh, we created that last week, last Monday. Now our our goal is to be in touch with uh, 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 most the represent, elected representatives at the municipal level. There's a lot of people that are elected at the municipal level, and they have more freedom because if you're uh, there's no party line when you're doing politics at the municipal levels usually. So it's uh, it's easier for you to take a position on a subject. It's a little bit more easier than if you are part of a, a caucus at the provincial or federal levels because you can be kicked out of your caucus if you take a position that uh, your leader won't like. But that's, that's contrary why, to their narrative. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why we want to focus. And uh, I, I was on the phone this uh, this morning with uh, some elected representatives at the municipal level. We want more of them to be part of our caucus with us. So that's the first step. Let's try to have more people on our side. And after that, we may do another meeting or a conference or something like that. We will have a discussion and uh, we want to do something in a month. We'll see what we can do as a caucus. But right now, our focus is to have more people uh, in the caucus with us and more Canadians that... uh, that are supporting the caucus by signing our petition at the libertycoalitioncanada.com. They can sign our petition and supporting our work. And if they know, if they know uh, an elected representative at their municipality, or uh, they can speak with them or her and asking her to be part of the caucus. So that's uh, that's the first step. The second one we'll see, but I think we'll have another meeting in the month, maybe in Ontario or or another place to have discussion about the next step. Okay, Omar, let me just get to the uh, Minister of Transportation, Doug, a quick uh, mention here, because he's been in the media. Uh, Omar uh, Al-Gabra, have you heard his recent interview? No, no. Okay, so he is supporting all of this stuff. When Air transportation is... I think responsible for 2% yeah. of the issues. Uh, Hillier stood up uh, and said to everybody in caucus, Hey, uh, or asked Trudeau, how many people are you going to detain? Where are these camps going? And he was laughed and his mic was turned off. He was laughed at. He was kind of ridiculed. 
And here we are. These people are coming in. I've got a ton of cases on my desk. They're, they're actually taking them from the airport to the hotels and making them believe that they got to get tested and they can't leave. What would you say to those people? Fight, fight for, for your freedom, you know. Uh, that's uh, unconstitutional what happened right now. And, uh, and just fight, you know. How come you're going to be in an hotel and pay 2000 bucks if you uh, test negative? <laughs> if you, you're negative, you have to be in an hotel for three days. So it, it's illegal. Don't you pay it. Be, don't pay the money. Yeah, the, first of all, don't don't pay it absolutely, and let the government sue you, and you'll win your case. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it's a shame that uh, that is happening right now in Canada. Mm -hmm. Certainly is. It's interesting the difference between what's happening in Canada and what's happening in the United States, where. In some sense, you know, we've got you guys have this protest movement that's actually happening. You've got a political party that's working on on having these conversations about the lockdowns where we have really none of that happening here. Um, but on the flip side, it seems like uh, your government's also moved forward with uh, some of some uh, harsher methodologies in terms of um, the the curfews that you're talking about, Maxime, and, as well as these uh, required testing facilities for people that are flying in, uh, and then being quarantined, forced quarantined, which hasn't started happening yet here in the U.S. Although there are rumblings, um, so it, it is just amazing as things are moving forward, how much more dangerous uh, the situation can become uh, if people don't figure out uh, some methodologies of standing up against it, and at least. Uh, having this conversation. I mean, that's the thing that's just boggling my mind. And I'm so happy that you're doing this work. Um, because just to just to publicize the fact that some people disagree with these lockdown tactics, where we have concerns that they're hurting more people than they're helping. And we need to have a national conversation where we don't feel uh, shamed into silence, or we're not censored because our perspective is valid and have a discussion about it in a, in a democracy, <laughs> right? And then yeah. and actually have uh, votes based on not, you know, one side that's controlling the media and censoring the, the opposing perspectives, but actually have a, a legitimate conversation and have uh, a legitimate democratic process that comes to the, the solutions. Um, it's just so frustrating to watch it go down the way it's been. But actually, in the U.S., um you have a, a good governor, the governor of Florida, that is mm. against lockdown. And at least you have an elected representative that is speaking. And uh, the mainstream media report reported what he said about the ending the lockdown. So at yeah. least you have a, a national, uh, right. uh, well-known politician that uh, is um, on the right side of the debate. But here in Canada, we don't have... Uh, the the, uh, the conservative party that is the opposition in Ottawa are in line with the liberals. Uh, so that's a shame, but that's the reality. Yeah, although we have seen uh, a representative here recently that just got stripped of committee appointments, just as you're describing with the conservative party, if you disagree with the party line, um, you know, you'll get pushed out of the party and you'll and you'll lose um, powerful positions or a say on committees or, you know, the kinds of things that might be able to help your career move forward. Um, so it's challenging, though, you know, it's got a lot of uh, a lot of different challenges. And I will say at least here, although I live in California, so I'm having the opposite problem. People that live oh. in California and New York uh, are having severe lockdowns. But um yeah, because uh, at least we have a more of a federalist system where the uh, some state governors have been able to, um, you know, go a little bit easier on the whole lockdown policy. And they haven't seen any difference in uh, cases from the virus as a result one way or the other, which is, uh, I think, almost amazing as time goes by where we can see that these lockdown policies really aren't effective. Uh, and we can see places that haven't locked down uh just as affected as places that have i mean they're right you know, like when Canada, has draconian to... rule ever worked when right. have draconian measures ever worked uh, apparently there has there's no history to support yeah. uh that they have ever worked there is a ton of history to support the fact that we are repeating history yeah. and all these lockdowns are not based on science 
uh, and they are mm. saying that you know very naturally in Quebec the the minister just said uh, you know yeah we're not doing that based on science and uh, they, they feel that they must do more lockdowns and a curfew so usually you try to justify your position as a politician based on good advice or, or, or a science but all these lockdowns it is not and they admitted that so uh, people must realize right. all that and uh, we are in the beginning and i think people are are tired of that and the more the more um, people will have on our side the more we'll be able to speak the more protests will do i think the better it will be for our cause mm-hmm. well doug i think uh we've got to bring maxine back Ma- maxine we've got to check in with you in a month yeah maybe sooner depending we're going to pay attention and see what the caucus is doing out there and how you guys are unfolding. Is there anything you'd like to finally tell the Canadian uh, well, citizens about what the caucus is going to do and where do you guys go from here? What is the next step for you guys for the caucus? Hillier, Sloan, and the rest of you. Yeah, so the next step for us, each of us, uh, we are uh, calling and trying to have more support from our colleagues, colleagues uh, at the national level in Parliament or in Ontario or in Quebec or other provinces. Well, so hang on. Can you get Baber? Is, is Baber going to jump on here? Have you talked to him? Have you said, hey, Baber, listen, you sent this powerful letter to, to uh, yeah. Doug Ford, our premier. Are, are you going to join us? Are you going to come on to the family here? Yes, actually, good question. Uh, I will call him uh, this afternoon and we'll have a discussion about it. But, you know, <clears throat> what he said, it's, it's a caucus. And we share the same view. We don't ask everybody, every member, every member of the caucus to share a different position. It's only on the lockdowns. And if you agree with that, that's our common goal and that's our only goal. So I will have a discussion with him. I, I will reach him this afternoon and I hope he will be part of the caucus. I, 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 I hope so. He's got no reason not to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm reaching also other uh, uh, members of the uh, National Assembly here in Quebec. So that's what I want to do. We want to have more elected representatives, part of the caucus, and uh, we'll have after that a meeting together and decide what would be the next step. Well, you know, the, the folks, anybody watching this, to all of our listeners here in Canada and on the U.S. side, listen, you've got to call your officials. You've got to yep. email them. You've got to tag them. This is, I, I hate to use war terms, but, you know, these are our weapons. This is all happening without bullets being fired. This is a psychological warfare. We've, we've got to understand this, Doug. You and I are covering this in our show. It's, it's extremely important that you start speaking directly to your officials. They want to be elected. And if you show them that there's a threat to their holding on to that seat, they're going to think twice about their position. As Maxime said, there's 70% of the people who are, who are out for these lockdowns and the 30% that aren't out for these lockdowns are suffering at the hands of the misunderstanding, the misinterpretations, the lack of, of, of proper and informed decision-making in the 70%. It is vital that you get onto the desks, the laptops, the phones, the emails, and all SMP social media platforms of these officials and tell them that we cannot live with these lockdowns anymore. They're killing people. They're doing more damage than the virus ever could. Let's stop the distortion. Let's stop the false evidence appearing real. Do your own research and make sure that you're in touch with those who are making decisions about the quality of your lives. Absolutely. And uh, Maxime, just to just to kind of close it off here, do you want us to send people to libertycoalitioncanada.com then where they can find more information? Absolutely, yeah. Libertycoalitioncanada.com. They, they will see uh, our declaration. Uh, they can sign our petition over there. And the more will be, uh, the better it would be for our cause. And I want to thank you for giving me that time to be with you guys today. Uh, I really appreciate that. And maybe we can do an update in a month. Uh, that would be interesting. But in the meantime, I can tell you that I will always fight for our freedom uh, here in this country. Well, we wish you guys the best in your endeavor, all of you. W- wish them our best from us. And uh, yeah, let's convene in a month. Reconvene. Yeah, 
Sounds good. Thanks. So Thanks, ladies, guy. And, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Maxime Bernier. He is the leader of uh, the People's Party in Canada, and he's heading up an anti-lockdown coalition of a number of politicians now that are working to really break free of this, uh, break this conversation out into the open, have a public conversation about uh, really if the lockdowns are helpful or not. Uh, and try to put some political pressure on the government to reduce uh, some of these lockdown policies that I think at least we're in agreement here uh, really are doing more harm than good. So thanks, Maxime, for coming on. And uh, George, you want to let people know where they can get in touch with you? Absolutely. Media at the line international dot com at the line media on Twitter, the line Canada on Twitter as well. Don't hesitate to email us. We will be following up with Maxime, Doug and I at the shift. Uh, who is my partnering producer on these shows. Remember, folks, we're not uh, supporting any one particular political party. We believe we're, we're an entire country. We have our missions. I think it's time to blur the lines and get together and understand all of these things. So don't hesitate to reach out to us with your thoughts. And if you have any questions, please feel free and invited. Sounds good. And uh, I have been your host for this special edition uh, with uh, my good friend uh, George Roche of The Line, uh, and I am uh, typically the host of The Shift with Doug McKenty, and you can find all my information at theshiftnow.com. You can get all of my uh, uh, old podcasts. I've got hundreds of hours worth of free stuff, and uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter there, and if you'd like, you can subscribe to the full-length uh, episodes of my interviews. This is this one's going to be given out uh, in its entirety as an extra um, for anyone who's interested uh, as we're giving Maxime some time to explain uh, the People's Party positions here. For those of you who are in the Canadian audience, and I think everyone here uh, in the United States and around the world can really learn from this as well. It's always great to see perspectives from people that are trying to stand up when they have a disagreement with what we're seeing going on here with respect to this virus and uh, the the government's responses with these lockdowns uh, and other measures that seem uh, to many to be pretty over the top and again doing more harm than good. So thanks again, gentlemen, for being on and uh, we will definitely keep tabs of, of this issue as it unfolds. So thanks for your work, Maxime. We'll talk soon. Thank you.